2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in the very first verse. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all, in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without, we were fightings. Within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that comforted comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by his consolation, wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I make you sorry, sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle have made you sorrow, sorry, though it have made, uh, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that, the, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye may not receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for bringing it in the English language for us to understand yeah. and to cherish and to love. Yes. Uh, thank you for preserving it. God, we pray now that you would bless that uh, holy word to those that will hear it. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching this morning on repentance as the hallmark of faith. Now, let me say this, unless you've just been saved, repentance belongs to the redeemed. Repentance does not belong to the lost until they're made alive. Right. Uh, I fully believe when the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, that precedes, that new birth re precedes any kind of spiritual uh, fruit, including repentance. You can't repent of something that you're not aware of. Uh, uh, and you're only aware of your sin nature once you have been redeemed, once you've been born again, and then you realize how foreign you really are, then I guarantee that you'll repent. If you remember John the Baptist, his first message was repent. The Lord Jesus Christ, his first message was repent. Now, we'll find that there are two brands of repentance, and the, the one is sold in volumes today, and that's the repentance as unto the type of Judas. He repented himself. Right. He was sorry he got caught. Now, you can, you can buy that by the bucket school today, but godly repentance is a gift of God. It can't be obtained. It is given rather than God. And so we see then that as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he rejoices in repentance. Uh, you know, we, we ought to rejoice in the same way. We live in such a wicked day today, almost repentance is shunned upon. It, it's almost that the, the repentant sinner is, is somewhat cautious to repent because he fears the repercussions. 
Whereas repentance should be sought after. Uh, repentance should be something uh, the child of God looks for. Now, back in chapter 7, and you all know the, cha uh, the chapters and the verses, <coughs> excuse me, are just outlines of the Word of God. They were never broken up into these verses until, uh, and probably until about 500 years ago. And they were just letters, and uh, you, don't, you don't number the sentences in a letter. And, but I want you to see, because of that, we need to go back and uh, catch 18, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 18, and it certainly wasn't planned this way, but if you remember Wednesday night, and sometimes I have trouble remembering last night, I preached from chapter 6 on Wednesday. And it wasn't, you know, after 20 plus years, I'm not a serial message type of preacher, but the Lord uh, led me directly to this text uh, in preparing for the message. So uh, since it starts with having therefore, and, and therefore always attaches to the sentence preceding, we'll pick, we'll pick up in 6, uh, uh, 17, and the whole, uh, the whole chapter in chapter 6 was living a separated life unto Christ. If Christ said it, if the Bible says it, therefore it has to be correct and has to be right. And so with separating from the world, beginning in verse 17, 6, 17, the Bible says this, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And then we see the promise, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so we have a promise of separation from the world equates the provision of the Father. Now, there are basically two purposes, two, uh, two tasks as a father that were to complete. The first one is provision. There's never bothered me anything anymore than a useless father that won't provide for his children. You know, uh, uh, it is my responsibility to provide for my children. If all I do is pick up cans and sell them, that is my responsibility to do it. But now what I have found, uh, I've been out of high school now uh, in May will be 35 years. And for that 35 years, I've had a full-time job somewhere and usually another part-time job if I wanted it. So don't tell me you can't find a job. Uh, don't, don't slide that by me. And so I want you to see, with that said, he's a provider. And then the other part that people don't necessarily <coughs> like is the disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. You have to discipline children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what's wrong with the modern day? Their children have never been disciplined. And, and listen, we're now probably in the third or fourth generation of undisciplined children. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, those, those youngins are not your friends, they're your children. And there is a huge difference. Those children are your responsibility, and if they turn out like trash, you can pretty much blame it on yourself. And I understand the election of God, but you know what? I've seen lost people act better than the redeemed. And you know why? Because mom and daddy sat down on them a long time ago. And, and, and so we see then as the Lord's people that uh, with this promise of having a heavenly father, we also have the promise of the two actions a father is to fulfill. So don't be surprised when they come up. So reminding them they have a heavenly father Paul continues, having therefore these promises, the promise of a heavenly father, the promise of provision, the promise of discipline, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of this flesh. 
Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you and I want you to consider who he's speaking to. In verse 17, he says, brothers and sisters. So he's talking to the redeemed. Mm -hmm. He's not talking to the lost. Uh, the only thing that you can present to the lost is the gospel. Mm -hmm. But you can present other things to the redeemed and including, we find here, they need repentance. They, uh, they need to get their lives in a situation to serve unto Christ. Let us cleanse ourselves, personal responsibility, cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of this flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, we find in the first verse, God's people are to be holy. They are to be a different people. Now, I want you to see there's two, two areas to clean. Flesh and spirit. Now, I want you to see the spirit in this text is not the S spirit, the capital S spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't need your help. You need His. And it's that little S spirit in how we present. How we look to others. How we're perceived by others. You know what? Uh, you can give somebody a hundred dollar bill and do it in such a way it's a disgust to them. We are to present differently than the world. That, that's the long and the short of it. Not pleasant preaching, but it is the truth. So we find that we are in a personal responsibility. Blame, don't blame it on the Almighty. Uh, uh, clean up our flesh, clean up our spirit, the way we present, perfecting holiness. What? In the fear of God. So we find we find the hitch pin, so to speak, and that is this, no fear of God. Now, I believe the redeemed has it. It may be in the back room somewhere, but I believe if you're truly redeemed, you will fear God. And, and so if, in fact, we are redeemed, and if in, in, if, in fact, we fear God, then repentance, living your life in a way that pleases God, putting the flesh aside, putting the foul spirit aside, ought to be your responsibility. Don't blame God if you say something out of the way. Uh, don't blame God if you present in a hateful manner. That's yours. That, that belongs to you. And so we see then, uh, these words were probably not real pleasant to the church at Corinth. Uh, receive us. We wrong no man. You know, uh, the, the, the preaching of biblical separation is about gone. And you know why? It hits people the wrong way. I've wronged no man. Uh, that may have been the theme of my ministry for nearly 30 years, but I hadn't done anybody no harm. Receive us. I've wronged no man. You know what that is? That's teaching the Bible. That's preaching the Bible as it's written. Yeah. And, and so we see that the reason may be uh, sometimes there's an echo in this building is because what? People are not perfecting holiness anymore. They give it to holiness, holiness people. They give it to people that wear their hair up in bonds all the time and run around and slobber on the floor. No, no. That belongs to the real church. That belongs to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to a group that are a bunch of fanatics. So, what happens when holiness is not present? And I fully believe this. He'll withdraw himself. He, he, wants no, he wants no part of the dirty, filthy people. So the Holy Ghost will withdraw himself. Receive us. We've wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Now what is it? 
when you defraud somebody, right? Um, the fraud is when you present a fraud, uh, a way, something that's not true and that you contribute to. Somebody says, oh, I'm coming up with a wonderful new invention. Get in while the getting's good. And you throw money in it and he's nothing but a liar and not an invention. He don't even have an idea. That's defraudment. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> he said, what I was selling you is not a bill of goods. It's the word of God. Uh, I, I'm telling you the truth this morning. And he says, receive me. I've not lied to you. I've not given you a bill of goods. I've not, I've not said anything wrong. And again, this is the same church that had a man running with his stepmother. And he laid it out. Named the whole situation specifically. And, and so we see same thing here. He says, listen, I, I've not hurt you. I've helped you. Verse 3. I, I speak not this to condemn you, for I said before that ye are in our hearts to die and believe with you. Now, he reminds them, I'm not saying this to be mean and to run you down the road. I did it because I love you. Uh, you know what? Uh, if you discipline your children just to be mean and you do it in a mean attitude, boy, they're going to pick up on it. And if you have a pastor that, that just browbeats you, you're going to know it too. But now discipline with love is why your children will cherish you when you get older. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord Jesus Christ disciplines me with love, I know I'm his. I, I, I know I belong to him. Uh, that's a paternal right. And, and so we find he... Uh, he, he does that for us. Paul says, uh, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I love you, not because I hate you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. Now, I want you to see a couple of things here. He says, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not condemning you. Now, this letter is an encouragement, and we'll see this very chapter move in this direction. And he says, I'm not doing this to condemn you. Now, I think that's interesting teaching, and I wonder why he said it that way. The reason is, I can't condemn you. First of all, I'm made out of the same junk you're made out of. But I do know one that can, and that's the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit makes my preaching real or Jared's preaching real or whomever's preaching will real, the Holy Ghost will condemn you. He said, I didn't condemn you. The Holy Ghost did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I didn't whip you. God whipped you. And, and certainly that's what we ought to desire in 2022 is that God would identify us by, by great, a great correction. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. Now, I think that is uh, a wonderful verse, and I believe that he gloried or was happy or saw that church magnify Christ was because of their repentance, because they turned that thing around, because they dealt with that man that was running around with his stepmother. <clears throat> they dealt with it and they wasn't afraid to. That, 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 that's, that's why he was glorying. They began to put Christ's things first and forget about the world. They began to, to serve him knowing that that was the very best for him. That's, that's why Paul gloried. Great is my glory in you. I am filled with comfort. Now, I wonder what brought him comfort or peace. I think the first thing, despite what the repercussions may have been, he told them the truth. Now, that can be very, a very, very hard job. Now, 
I worked hospice for a number of years, I guess about five years, something like that. Uh, and you would be surprised how many patients I was the first one that was frank with them and said, you're not going to make it. Now, a doctor that had treated them for cancer for five or six years never shot straight with them. That's sad, ain't it? Yeah. Well, I'm shooting straight with you this morning. What we need is repentance. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and Paul certainly saw that, and he certainly understood it, and he had the boldness to write the first letter, irregardless of the repercussions. <coughs> he was bold. Uh, the end of that verse, I'm exceeding for joy and joyful in all, all our tribulations. Now, sometimes I read this, and Jared, you read it too, because preaching the truth, don't you, you're not going to get cartwheels. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you'll even get that many engagements. Because, but as a result, there were tribulations. Uh, you know, I bet old Paul didn't preach a lot of revival meetings. Do you? And you know why? They didn't want to hear it. They weren't interested in the truth. Now, they were interested in maybe something that people would tell them and how good they was doing and how well it was going, irregardless of the condition of the church, but they, uh, they didn't want the truth. And he said, listen, I, I took shots because of it as well. Verse 5, For when we were come to unto Macedonia... Our flesh had no rest. Now, have you ever laid down and just can't sleep at night? Every one of us have. Whether you were stressed about your children, whether you were stressed about work, whether you uh, were stressed about a loved one, you were concerned about their soul, whatever the situation, we've lost nights of sleep. And I, I, I believe that it was... Uh, I believe it was because of how concerned he was for Macedonia. You remember how he got there? He had a vision that said, come over here and help us. Mm -hmm. Now, when he got there, they weren't chopping at the bit. <laughs> right. And you know, that was a stress to him, don't you think? Have I missed the will of God? Am I really, suppo am I really where I'm supposed to be? And he said, I was in great tribulation. I was stressed. Uh, I wasn't sure if I had the mind of God or not. And every one of us has been through that. You don't have to be a preaching man to experience what Paul uh, experienced. For when we were come unto my, into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. We were uh, without were fightings, well, then, we're fears. There's going to be fearful times coming along, church. And I don't think they're very far down the road for the Lord's true churches. Now, um, uh, Jared and Adam are wanting to buy me a strobe light and uh, change things around a little bit. You know what? We could pack the house out, could we not? But... <laughs> What, what would we be giving up? Of course, they were kidding. They really want it so I'll know when to stop preaching when it gets to the 12 o'clock hour. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what people sell as a bill of goods today, don't they? That, that, that's, that's religion. That is worshiping. Whatever they want to fill in the blank with, that's fine. That's what they want. But I want you to see Paul was filled with problems and he was fearful. I believe his fear, his main fear with this is I've missed the will of God. And if you've ever been in that situation, you'll have the same, uh, you'll have the same response. Verse 6, nevertheless, God that comforteth those who are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, uh, 
when you come, uh, when you need it most, somebody will come from God. When you need it most, someone will come your way and encourage you. And I want you see, to see the message of encouragement wasn't, listen, you're going to establish a church at Macedonia. Because you know what? The truth being told, uh, old Titus didn't know whether he would or not. <laughs> you don't know the end result of the ministry. How many times did Paul and Silas leave a place and shake off the dirt when they left? And the reason why there was no repentance in that city. But what encouraged him was the result of a very bold, bold letter. Now, uh, the bold, bold letter re resulted in repentance. Resulted in sorrow for sin. So Titus arrives, verse 7 and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, that's to serve Christ, an earnest desire, when you see that in people, it's a great encouragement, and how you see that is irregardless of circumstance, they want this book. They want the ideals presented in this book. Uh, though all hell shake against them, though uh, mother leaves, though daddy leaves, though wife leaves, here in this, they're comforted. And that's, that's the hallmark of a believer. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith was comforted in you. What he said about you was a comfort to me. When he told us of your earnest desire, how's your desire to serve Christ this morning? That, that's very important. If we don't have an earnest desire, there may, there may be a need of repentance, yeah. uh, of, of drawing nearer once more unto Christ. He was also comforted by your mourning. Now, Mourning indicates the death of someone or something, right? You know what? It died. Them defending that that double mar uh, I mean that uh, man running with his stepfather. I mean stepmother. That had died. Either those people were long gone, or they got it right. They dealt with all the issues in the church, and it made them sad. You know, I have to fully wonder if that man left the church. He probably did. You know, when someone leaves, it ought to cause mourning. When someone dies and no longer in your life, certainly it causes mourning. When somebody leaves the church because they don't want to hear truth, it shouldn't make us mad. It should evoke sadness. Mourning. Uh, something is gone. Something's no longer with us. And so they were mourning over their sin. Your fervent mind toward me. They took what Paul said as gospel truth. So that I rejoiced the more. In this bad state, I heard that you repented. And it gave me great, a great boost. It gave me a great encouragement in the spirit. Verse 8. Though, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived the same epistle made you sorry, though were but for a season. So what he's saying, <laughs> I wrote it, I didn't feel bad about it, that's what you needed. But when I heard it worked, when I heard God used it to bring repentance, I was sorry. Now, he wasn't sorry he wrote it, and like, I apologize, I shouldn't have never done it to start with. He was mourning with them. Yeah. He was repentant with them, not that he'd been involved in that thing, but you know what? Anytime God's people see sin in the believer's life, it ought to make us not mad, but sorry. A time of repentance. A time of prayer. And so he said, when I heard uh, 
I heard you repented. Uh, I repented right with you. I was sorry right with you. I mourned right with you. And that's the hallmark of a good pastor. Verse 9. Now I rejoice. Now I'm happy. Now I'm glad my sorrow time is over and my gladness is come. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Now that's everything, is it not? That's the brand of sorrow we need. That's the type uh, that leads to repentance. That's the type that uh, leads to, Lord, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was doing. It, it don't even become a person of Christ. I'm sorry. That's where repentance is. And he said this letter not only made you sorry, but it made you repent as well. For ye were made sorry after a godly man. Now that belongs to the redeemed. That, that, that does not belong to the world. It belongs to us. So what that tells me is two things. Number one, God brings it. And number two, the redeemed repent too. The saved have sin in their life and they have to repent. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of for the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now we find another brand of, of sorry that leads to death and we'll read of one individual that that's the type he had. And when it says death Brother Jared it means both ways. It read, it, it'll lead to your carnal death but more sorrowful is it leads to your spiritual death mm -hmm. if people don't repent of sin I am unconvinced of redemption and that may seem harsh and that may seem mean but I believe it is Bible yeah. uh, I'm with my own children and hopefully the result is daddy I'm sorry right I don't I don't snatch up Jarrett's kid and work them over one not my responsibilities those belong to him and if you do it right what I've seen and being a dad nearly 32 years it works it does it really does uh, I believe, I believe the sound parenting is a promise of the Bible, and if we follow it, it will work. I, I fully believe that. And, and, and so we see, uh, as, he's, as he's writing to the church, he said it, it was the right time. For godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to, repent it, to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world work its death. I'm sorry I got caught. Right? You know what that type of sorrow always brings? Anger. Get you mad at the preacher, get you mad at your friend, get you mad at the church. Right? That, that, that's not repentance. It's sorry. You know, sorrow is repentance. Sorrow. You know, when someone calls you sorry, they don't mean it as a compliment, do they? You sorry excuse, right? They, they don't mean that with a pat on the back, do they? And that's the type of sorrow that will lead you on to death. That's the type that will take you into hell. Now, this wasn't in our text, but let's pick up verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing, exactly the same, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. That's what we need. That's what we ought to crave. That's what will keep you in line with the Almighty. A godly sorrow, what carefulness it wrought in you. A, uh, a hallmark of... Uh, of the redeemed of a godly sorrow is this it makes you careful the next time 
If you get caught in, if you get caught up in sin, when the same sin approaches you again, or even something similar, you're like, get away from that. I don't, I don't need to be a part of that. It makes you careful. It makes you more cautious than, you, than it did when you started. That, again, is, it is the result of repentance and the hallmark of the redeemed. And, and so we see that as well. <laughs> For behold this self-same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought with you, yea, what, uh, what clearing of yourselves. You ever had muddled thoughts? Just like, I, I'm not sure which way is correct. Every one of us has. Don't, don't pretend. You know when clearness comes? When you're right with the Lord. That's when you'll see it for what it is. These people began to see this man not as a good contributor, not as a member of the church, not someone to be respected. They clearly saw, saw him for what he was. You know, uh, it, was, it was no longer he attends regularly. He's a good man. I know that he has that little problem with his stepmama. But he's still a good man. No, they saw it clear. Man, that's trash. We don't need it in the church. Right? right? And, and, and that comes when God's real people <laughs> began to get uh, clear spiritually and see things in the light of truth. Yea, what, what indignation. They got like, oh my gosh. I can't believe this is in the church. They got indignant at this these two individuals. Yea, what fear. They were fearful something would happen to the church. Yea, what vehement desire. What zeal. How's your zeal this morning? That's a, that's a, spiritual, um, that's a spiritual indication. When your fuel light comes on, ding, what do you know? You know the, the fuel's low. Well, when your zeal is gone, the fuel light is on. Okay? Uh, when you're no longer zealous of the person of Christ, now you don't have to be doing cartwheels down 49 to draw attention, but when your zeal for Christ is low, listen, dear friends, something is spiritually wrong. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that Paul's very much encouraging. Your zeal is on full. What? And I think this is a very, very interesting word. Yea, what, re, what revenge? That man had grown the church. They wanted it right. <coughs> interesting, isn't it? Right. In all things, ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Don't stress about it no more. You dealt with it in the right way. God's going to bless it. And that's the way we ought to be. Now, uh, I, want to see, I want to show you very quickly, and, and you know what I'm going to read, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter uh, 27. Uh, Matthew 27. Matthew 27. In, in the first verse. Matthew 27, in the first verse, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And, and they said, what is that to us? <laughs> See thou to it, to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now that's the result of fake repentance. 
I, I believe, well, the Bible said, the Lord Jesus said, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you right. is a devil? Yeah. I have no, I, I don't believe he was saved. I had someone try to teach me by this, Judas was saved. No, no. Mm -hmm. Now, if it said that he repented and clinged unto Jesus, I might, I might buy into that. But it said that he repented himself. I'm sorry I got caught. I, I, I'm sorry that, uh, that, that how it's fallen out. And he took the reward of iniquity, that 30 pieces of silver, and put it down in the temple. Um, but you know what? It did say that there was a reward for iniquity, did it not? Now, he never spent it. But what did, uh, was it Moses? As he was given the law, maybe? There's pleasure in sin for a season. You know what? Judas' season was real, real short. What? Mm -hmm. 12 hours? Some people enjoy it a little longer than that, but the end result is the same, is it not? So we find a type of repentance that we have, we ought to want nothing to do with. Now, right back from there in Matthew 26, verse 73, just a little up from there, Matthew 26 and verse 73, and after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy, thy speech betrayeth thee. In other words, he was talking like a Christian. Yeah. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ had already predicted that this would be the occurrence First, another thing, and, and this is a hallmark uh, of a lost person, just a filthy potty mouth. He was cursing and swearing. Oh, I don't know him. <clears throat> explicative, explicative. And then the cop crew. Yeah. <clears throat> just like Jesus said that it would. Have you ever thought that we serve such a, a magnificent God that he can tell a rooster when to crow? <laughs> but he did, didn't he? And that brought repentance. You know, usually we think of a preaching message that brings repentance. But that little old rooster uh, belted one out, verse 75, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. That is the hallmark of the redeemed. Repentance. Recognizing sin in your life and not just and not just recognizing it and going on, but being repentant about it. Um, being sorrowful for it after a godly, a godly sort. So certainly that's what everyone needs in the modern day when sin is the norm and accepting it is just that. Idolatry, worldly dress, looking and acting like the world in that is sin. And we ought to repent after a godly sort. 